So uh, I guess one of the uh, downsides of being a lawyer is that I get to read all of the uh, documentation that comes out of every single cop. And I've been doing that for many, many years. I've just recently reviewed and read every single word coming out of Lima, including all of the reports by various agencies. So I'm talking about climate justice and funding um, for adaptation and loss and damage. And just because there was that question asked by my colleague, um, Professor Ko Kang Lian, about, well, how do we know? What, to what extent climate change influences these disasters. This is the way that the IPCC frames disasters, where you see on the left the hazard is climate, whether it's uh, natural variability or climate change. Of course, with climate change, which is anthropogenic, um, influencing that hazard, and then the intersection between that hazard and then vulnerability and exposure. So the statistics what I'm, that I'm going to show you in a moment don't suggest to you that the absolutely accelerated loss and damage is due to climate change only. Of course, it has very much to do with uh, questions of vulnerability and exposure. But for all of us, the solution space which the IPCC puts forward is that in order to minimise the risk of climate disasters, we need to do all of the things which are in the boxes. Vulnerability and exposure, reducing that, reducing the risk, bringing down greenhouse gas emissions. The best way to, to adapt is to mitigate. Um, deal with socioeconomic pathways and so on, and governance. So each one of these boxes is relevant to lawyers and each one of these boxes is relevant to funding because the funding that needs to happen, particularly in developing countries most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change is absolutely crucial. Now, having just spent uh, probably a, a three years investigating almost every climate disaster in the world. It's not the way to make one feel particularly happy. I just want to give you some um, statistics there. Um, worldwide, insured losses alone from weather-related disasters have ri risen from 5.1 billion um, between 1970 and 1990 to 27 billion annually over the past two decades. So in the summer of 2010, China suffered a major flood, which, as you can see, affected 230 million people, 15 million of whom became homeless, with overall damages estimated to be 53 billion, with insured losses. And I want us to focus on the insured losses of only um, 761 million. The same in Pakistan, affected by exactly the same massive rainfall event, affecting 20 million people, a massive loss of um, crops, 2.2 million hectares of crops, estimated damage of 9.5 billion, of which only 100 million was insured. The 2011 um, Thai flood was calculated by Lloyds to uh, have racked up a damage bill of 30 billion, or 8.68% uh, of GDP, of which, um, of which only 12 billion was insured. Uh, Typhoon Haiyan causing a total uh, estimated damage of 14.5 billion with only 300 million insured. And then Hurricane Sandy, a bill of about 50 billion with insured losses of only 20 billion. So I guess the question is who's going to, to compensate those people who are victims and who are suffering from these disasters? Now, like others in the room, such as Brina and, and David, I adopt a capability approach to thinking about climate disasters and um, I, I extend this approach to those who suffer climate disasters in developed and developing economies if we think of the socioeconomic uh, risks that were faced uh, in Hurricane Katrina by low socioeconomic groups um, living in, in, the, in the, the zone. Uh, the Queensland flood. So I'm thinking here about life cycle vulnerability and how that relates to a capability approach. Um, and the reason, of course, is that if you look at the scale of losses, the capabilities of people are fundamentally undermined, even where so much development work has gone to building and creating capabilities, as Nussbaum, um, Nussbaum's latest book um, tends to suggest. So. Uh, there are significant 
economic, we've only spoken about economic losses, but non-economic losses as well. And those tend to be the losses to ecosystems and the losses, the devastation to people's lives that can't be quantified as an economic loss. And then the other reason is I have been very inspired by um, Sen's book called The Idea of Justice, which really, of course, you know, Brina's presentation is so important because what he's saying is that it's all very well to have these global notions of justice, but you have to focus on the actual lives that people are living and the way in which their capabilities are impacted. And he goes on to say that so much for social contract theory, we shouldn't be focusing on institutions of social contract theory, but thinking about the nation state and extending the discussion of how we want our society to look and the way that we're going to deal with climate change to those most impacted. And he talks about people far away, meaning in different jurisdictions, but I extend that to uh, thinking about uh, this on a temporal scale. So the future generations which are far away. So human and non-human capabilities and thinking about that on a spatial and a temporal scale. So that's really the sort of theoretical foundation um, of the book. Although, of course, there's um, far more in there as well. In fact, much of what um, Robin has spoken about as well. So what I want to talk about now is the institutions for funding which the UNF um, Triple C has um, put in place. And the message which you're going to hopefully get is that these institutions are woefully short of funding to do the work that they are supposed to do. So if you read the texts, you would think, yeah, we have an ad adaptation fund, we have committees, we have now the Warsaw mechanism, but it's important to look at the detail. So the first adaptation fund was set up in 2001, and the idea was that 2% of the funds generated from selling a particular type of carbon credit, which is derived from doing development, sustainable development projects in, in developing countries called the Clean Development Mechanism, 2% of the sale of those projects would go into the fund. Now, uh, in 2012 at Doha, it was agreed that because that fund was uh, short of funds because there hadn't been enough trade in CDMs, they would add the other carbon credits which are recognized under the Kyoto <laughs> Protocol, and that 2% of the share of a whole lot of other of those credits would go into the fund to boost it. So that's one fund. The second, uh, two, the next, the second and third fund are, were established by the UNFCCC to be managed by the Global Environment Facility. That's the least developed countries fund to deal with adaptation planning and the special climate change fund uh, established in 2001 to finance a whole range of activities relating to adaptation, mitigation and so on in developing countries. Now, um, in 2010, at Cancun, uh, a new fund was set up, the, the uh, Green Climate Fund, and the idea was that this fund will uh, bring together all of the funding from different countries and be the sort of agency that manages and distributes the funds. Now, the agreement that was forged in 2009 at Copenhagen, even though it wasn't binding, it was there as part of the accord, but the agreement in Cancun and now was that countries would pay $100 billion per year, developed countries, um, by 2020. So let's just investigate what's happening with these funds. Um, at Warsaw, the, the COP was uh, very concerned and it drew attention to the fact that if the adaptation fund is relying on these, the sale of these carbon credits under the Kyoto Protocol, then we're in trouble because of the way that the price of these credits dropped dramatically. So if you can see there, around 10 euros um, in 2010, dropping to 17 cents um, in December 2012. And so given this, the, the um, parties decided that they would set up a, by, um, a high level ministerial dialogue starting in 2014 and ending in 2020 to think about how adaptation um, and loss and damage is going to be funded. So these are the reports that were put by the funds to Lima. Um, and in their reports, they basically said, 
uh, the Adaptation Fund Board said the process of developing national adaptation plans isn't occurring at an acceptable rate. In fact, only 15 National Adaptation Fund implementing in entities in developing countries have been accredited under the mechanism. Now, the Green Climate Fund also reported to Lima, and what they said was that they've only received $10.2 billion from contributing parties. Now, remember, they're supposed to be putting up $100 billion a year up to 2020. So the COP pleaded, essentially, with the GF GCF to say you've got to accelerate the oper operationalization of these funds to LDCs, small island developing countries, and um, Africa. Now, the GEF also reported to the COP, and they said that, well, we've just got our sixth replenishment for the years 2014 to 2018, but the amount of money devoted to the climate change focal area has to be drastically diminished. And so we have to decrease our allocations to those countries most uh, vulnerable. And also it reported on the two funds which it's managing, saying to do what we have to do under the least developed um, country fund, we need seven to 900 million. And as of September 2014, we've got no resources available to fund new programs. And the same with the, um, the Special Climate Change Fund, that uh, we're meeting less than 30% of demand, and we need four to 500 million. So in any case, even with the funding available, only 38% of LDCF and 32% of um, SCC funding, which has actually been committed, has been dispersed. So we have a funding problem. Um, and this is, these are official reports to the COP. Um, I just want to also have a look at the question of um, ODA. Where does ODA where, what role does ODA play in terms of disaster risk reduction? Well, it's been a very low priority um, over the past two, two decades, and you can see that even though three trillion dollars has been dispersed, uh, only 106.7 billion to disasters and only 13 billion to um, disaster risk reduction. So, and the, the other point about it is that it seems as if most of the money is actually going to wealthier developing countries like um, China and India. So those two countries are receiving 22% uh, of the funding for disaster risk reduction. And you can see by going through the slides there um, that uh, the top 30 recipients in developing countries have received 84.6% of funding um, and the rest, the other 118 countries, have had to share pretty much what's left over. So the question is then, uh, so th there isn't enough money for adaptation um, in developing countries, uh, and in developed countries, not many countries are doing what they should on adaptation. So what about post the disaster, there are victims. Government steps in. Um, but one of the questions which has been asked is um, whether or not governments have any political motivation to do it. Uh, and the answer is yes, they've got more motivation to pay after the event than to engage in adaptation, because no one sees adaptation. But they love to see the government uh, going in there with aid and so on. But an even fundamental, um, more fundamental problem is the debate amongst legal academics whether or not government has any obligation to do this or not. So they're not engaging in adaptation, but one argument, the free market response, is that they have no uh, obligation under social contract theory to, to compensate the victims. So, you know, that's the idea that, well, it's all about self-sufficiency, individualism, sort yourselves out, you prepare for the disaster. Um, small government doesn't invest in infrastructure, doesn't believe in social security, and so on. And in fact, I've read a paper where it's regarded as nothing more than charity if governments do decide to stump up the money, and it's a charity hazard. Um, or, of course, the social contract view that it's, uh, it's a duty of government to protect citizens and to look after them. So for my book, I looked at a whole lot of different um, schemes. You can see them listed there. The most important point about these schemes is that the, uh, 
post-disaster payments are only for losses that are uninsured, they are only for economic losses, they are meagre, and they are almost never budgeted for in advance, which means that government have to go, like after Hurricane Sandy, to Congress to plead for special appropriations, or like in the Queensland floods where everyone gets taxed. So then they're almost never budgeted for. In any case, in developing countries, you've got very exhausted tax bases. So my final point, and I was um, you know, very disappointed to hear from Neil um, that uh, apparently climate disaster response funds aren't the way to go. I, m I may have misunderstood you, but anyway, um, I have an idea for um, a climate disaster response fund because government, if you think of the institutions for compensation, we've looked at the limits of government, we've looked at the limits of insurance, we've looked at the limits of, well we haven't, but we don't have time, to look at the limits of tort law. Um, and so what I have done is to um, investigate in a huge amount of detail the legal liability regimes, strict legal liability regimes which operate in respect of hazardous chemicals, major oil spills, asbestos and nuclear accidents. And I've devised an idea for a climate um, disaster response fund only for those people in the least developed countries most impacted by climate change. And just a few points of similarity between all of these funds that resonate with the idea of making fossil fuel, um, those who enter fossil fuels into the global energy system liable, all the activities are, are hazardous. The government intervenes in all of these instances, either at international law, in fact a lot at international law or domestically. A fund is established through a tax on upstream hazards, such as uh, oil, coal, and gas. The entities which are liable to contribute are clearly identified. Uh, liability is strict. If you produce it, you're liable. Um, a pro rata on a pro rata basis. And the liability is often uh, based on unknown future claimants, like in asbestos cases. Each of these schemes has different uh, layers for when government pays, when the insurer steps in, and when the fund steps in. And also the types of damages can be easily categorized. What are you going to claim for under this fund? And there are even instances where environmental damage um, is, claimed from, is claimed for and compensated under the fund. So that paper is about to appear in the Transnational Environmental Law Journal. And um, of course, that sort of discussion is in its early, very early stages for many of the reasons that we've discussed. So thanks very much.